Welcome, this is Heather Knudsen, HomeSphere's Director of Marketing. I want to welcome each of you to today's webinar that is sponsored by Isonine. We know today's topic is of interest as we welcome our 500 participants registered for today's event. Our presenter today is Molly Carmichael from John Burns Real Estate Consulting. They're an industry leader in housing research and will be providing an overview on understanding home buyer motivation. Remember that you'll have the opportunity to type questions in that will be asked at the end, time permitting. With that said, I'd like to turn things over to Molly to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to go through um, some of the top trends from our recent survey. Um, thanks to many of the builders across the country, we launched a survey to new home shoppers out there looking for a home today. And we're going to share some of those top trends. I could just talk about this for hours, but we're going to hit some of the highlights in about 45 minutes and then, uh, and, and then end with some questions. So as you can see on the screen in front of you, you'll see a map to the upper right-hand corner. <clears throat> we surveyed, again, shoppers across the country through September of this year. We ended up with over 20,000 respondents. And, and one of the things we were able to do as well this year is we had Billow as a partner in this because we wanted to see some of those relationships between the resale market, the new home market, are there any big differences? And, and I'll hit some of those highlights as well. So um, as you can see, we got a great coverage across the country. Um, we saw great coverage not just in the Southwest, but in Texas, Florida, the Southeast, all of the major new home uh, markets across the country. So it was a huge success. We also have over 100 plus questions as well. So we're going to cover, I think, maybe 10 to 15. But we can slice and dice these and hen really have studied the heck out of these by life stage, by price point, by generation, which is a big debate that always comes up quite a bit. Um, so I'll cover some of those highlights, um, and we'll go from there. So. One of the things before we begin, um, our company is really big on not just doing research like consumer research, but it's really the whole gamut. So looking at market health, demand by life stage, but certainly if you don't understand first what consumers want, that's really what our discussion is today. And then going out there and looking at where supply is, what the builders are doing. And, and we spend a lot of time with architects really kind of coming up with new innovation as well as looking at what's working out there as well. And then, of course, financially testing it and so forth. And then the builders go out there and, uh, and, and sell, build. And, and we hear a lot from them on the front lines as well. Before we begin, I want to talk about sort of who took the survey in relationship to the market. And there were some interesting things that have been for the last several years as we've been doing this study. Um, if you look at the graph in front of you, you have basically a summary of the people who took the survey from the resale market, uh, which is in green, the new home market, which is in red, and then the total population, and we looked to a population of buying age, which is 25 plus. Um, and what you'll see just by the generations, one thing that kind of has been coming up consistently for the last three years is Gen Y is surprisingly absent based on the population out there. So I'd like to uncover a few myths as it relates to Gen Y and why they are so um, light in the market today. Uh, when we started this three years ago, we were showing about 11% of the total population buying was Gen Y. And that's actually dropped a little bit to 9%, despite the fact that Gen Y is growing in that age group of 25 plus. So um, one of my big questions when I went through this is, why is that so light? But the other really important fact when you're looking at this slide is that Gen X is the number one buyer out there today. And that shifted a little bit from last year. The boomers were actually the larger percentage of all the groups out there shopping. Gen X was taking a much bigger role, but certainly they were big last year too. And they'll stay a very large role until about 2017 to 2018, I'm predicting. And that's really when uh, Gen Y is going to start running up. And you'll see why. <clears throat> So certainly, as you guys are planning for products, community planning, whatever it is that you're doing out there in the real estate world, uh, certainly understanding what Gen X wants, followed by the rumors, is, is, is really important. So where is Gen Y today, and why is that? And, and we, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of work done on Gen Y and so forth, but 
really the big thing when you look at the total percentage of population today, 36% of Gen Y, and this explains more than a third of those shoppers that aren't out there, um, are living at home with parents. And so that's, that's a big one is are, they, are there so many more staying at home? Another 23% are married, 27% are renting, living with roommates, and another 7% live at home. But what was more interesting to me is I wanted to compare that back to a time where maybe we weren't so you know, focused on that generation or not. But if I look at the 18 to 32 population in 1981, the big difference really isn't the percentage of, of consumers in this age group living at home with their parents. It's only about 6% different from its prior number, um, 31% in 1981. The big difference is the percentage of people that are actually married in this group, 18 to 31, and that is 43% were married in 1981, and only 23% are married today, and more of those are, are in the rental market or, once again, living at home. So, so that explains about 30% are living with parents. Another 30% just simply haven't married, and we know that's a really big trigger for home ownership. Interestingly enough, though, when we look at the percentage of shoppers that are out there shopping, um, it really ticks up quite dramatically when you get to ages 33 to 35, and you'll see that actually in the numbers. So, so really, a big part of why Gen Y is not out there, and I've had people say, well, is it because they shop differently, they don't take online surveys? They're probably more likely to take online surveys as I'm looking at some of the other work we do. It's really largely because they're, they're really not in the market yet, but they're coming. So why, why you know, uh, we do a lot of qualitative work as well and focus groups and things like that. And one of the things, this was a great quote that I found in some of the stuff I've been reading on this, and, and this rings very true with what we've been hearing from our Gen Y uh, cohorts out there, and that is, you know, I like living at home. I love my family. Boomers are the first generation to really spoil their children at 18 years of grading and encourage them to stay home and save money. And Gen Y likes to stay home and save money, and there's nothing really triggering that. Things like student loans, um, it's not necessarily more debt. They actually have less debt unless it is sort of that, that student loan category. So um, certainly um, certainly explains a lot of what's going on with Gen Y. So let's look at who else is out there shopping. Um, as we just look at simply the percentage of people out there that own versus rent and so forth, we have about 58% uh, that actually own. That 19 to 20%, depending on if it was owners or renters, or, yeah, owners or looking in the retail market are um, renters out there. So we have a, that is down a little bit from last year, so we have more owners. So equity is certainly super important as we go forward. Um, as we look to life stage, um, the life stages that are out there, this is equally important. We have about, when you look at the family cohorts, just mature family and young family, we're looking at about 30% family. One of the other categories we added this year was mature plus family, which is those households that have that 19-year-old um, or greater living at home. So that's about 35% family. And then if you throw in there young couples that are actually planning, maybe potentially getting married or, or are married at some point and planning for family, that's another 13%. So we're at about 48% that could potentially or be family, but a bigger percentage is actually non-family. So if you look at the sample by price range, this is very consistent with the national number. So we got a great sample across the board and uh, still a healthy sample in the 700 plus ranges as well. Um, and we look at um, uh, that sample by age group, You'll also see, again, in that 30 to 34, or let's say 34 and below, we only had 9% Gen Y, but we have roughly 16% of uh, that 34 and below. So there is that delta of 6% that makes up um, that difference in that 33 to 34 range. So we are seeing that, uh, quite a burst in those um, in the age group just above uh, the Gen Y as we're calculating it. As we look to this by ethnicity, you'll see a large percentage of Caucasian shoppers, but we have a healthy percentage of African American, Asian. These all tie very well with um, the national statistics, so there's a nice balance there, and we can actually go in and look at those uh, responses by Asian or whatever specific market you may be targeting. 
So let's dive into top trends. As we look at the last three years, we've asked consumers amongst about 16 different variables, what are the top motivating factors, whether it's schools or safety or you name it. And interestingly enough, the top three that we more commonly would have put at the top three are location, price, um, and, and safety. Those would have been my top three that I would have guessed. But interestingly enough, for the last two years, location has been number one with a very close second, which has been home design. And we translate home design to interior layout, layout and you'll see that actually more in the numbers that we're going to show you. But this year, price climbs above actually home design and becomes number two. So last year, price was number four. And why was that? It's because it was really a much more affordable time. As prices have gone up in some markets, you know, 25 plus percent um, and maybe less in others, but certainly we've seen some very healthy price increases. That's really why we're seeing more owners in the market. We're seeing more mature couples confident that they have equity because that's been a big concern in the last three years of surveys that we've been doing. So we're starting to see some movement because those prices have increased. But we're also seeing some movement in what their priorities are and motivations are. And that could be influencing why we're seeing a slight drop in the Gen Y buyers out there shopping because they just aren't finding or aren't able to, to play the game. When we compared that actually to the resale market, there were actually fewer Gen Ys looking in the resale market than actually looking in the new home market, um, which was really interesting because there's a lot of, I've read, you know, tons out there saying, well, you know, Gen Y just isn't a new home buyer. They want more of that kind of retro, shabby chic, you name it. We definitely didn't see that in the numbers. So as you look to the hierarchy of motivation to the right, this is really our summary for the whole country, really, as, as motivation is created. And this is built on affluence and life stage. So the least affluent, um, non-family or family profile at the very bottom, it's price. You know, so you have to really, you have to pay to play. And, and so price becomes the first motivating factor, albeit it moves based on affluence and how things change with with uh, what's out there in the market. And then, of course, it's driving down three ways, and so location becomes a factor. And that location shifts if I have children or I've just been married or if I'm single, right? So you'll find more singles or non-family or even divorced family living closer to employment centers. And then more families will drive for, of course, land or bigger backyards or a different kind of lifestyle. Maybe it's safety in some locations. But interestingly, and, and continues to be very important, is the importance of interior home design and layout of that home and how that supports your lifestyle. And that's very much based on sort of how you nurture and make relationships because really that is what's most important. So that interior home design, whether you're a community developer, a home builder, or even some of the subcontractors or investors out there looking for places to invest, Really understanding and making sure that design is right is probably as critical as finding the right location and things like that because it will impact um, what you pay and what you get paid and your profits. <clears throat> the other things that are important, of course, are you know, is there retail nearby? Can they get a gallon of milk? Those things, that's proximity to needs. And of course, the logical thing is these become more wants versus needs. I want the best education, whether I have children or not. Schools influence my investment. I want good exteriors. I want community design. I want I want to give back after all of this. I have to be. I want to actually give back as well. So that's the top trend. The the next one really is um, shoppers want location, but not necessarily urban. There's all kinds of um, urban that um, like that. And so we asked the question with getting visuals. We made some descriptions for that. And what we found nationally is only 7% total actually want urban. And then I broke it out by generations just to test that. And it's 11% of Gen Y wants urban. And that's, of course, slightly greater because we have more non family in that generational group, too. So that number does go down as you look at life stages and they create families and marriage and things like that. So, so certainly. Um, it's a, a small percentage, and there's a niche out there for that percentage um, where you can offer that, but it's not the majority. And, and why is that? The big reason is 
75%, whether it's Gen Y or the total population, wants a single family detached home. As we have dove into that kind of information more specifically, what we have found, what people really want, and as they reference urban, is the ability to walk to the local Starbucks or walk to the park in their neighborhood. But they still want single family. You will find that Gen Y, depending on affluence and so forth, um, like their boomer parents, um, is more likely today to give up yard size, no matter where you are at in the country. Um, and certainly that's about choices and investments and things like that. But they are more likely to give up lot size because they don't want to be a slave to that outdoor space. The next trend we have is, and this will continue to support how important the in-care home design is, is while home design drops to number three, it's certainly very important because when we ask people what the number one home feature was to them, um, they really wanted number one was interior style, followed by more function versus size, then followed by interior space, all sort of leading to that interior space. Affordability price, which tends to be so important, um, and does rank highest for the least affluent, um, becomes number four. So that style, that function, that interior space is very important. And things like performance and curb appeal, and sadly for you builders, their builder reputation ends up being more towards the bottom. And in builder reputation, they, they want a great builder for sure. So don't underscore that. It's just when it comes down to house and style and things like that, those are the primary things you're looking for. Another support for this is when we ask them, what's prompting you to actually shop for a home today? Why are you out in the market today? And again, it all relates back to, to style and design. Um, uh, number one and two that are tied is a different home, a different layout, tied with seeking a home with newer features and design. And then things like change in location, low interest rates, and things like that start to pop up. The lowest, smaller home versus larger home, change in household. And uh, confidence in the housing market is definitely increasing, so we're seeing that drop down quite a bit. As we look to top obstacles to buying today, last year it was all about down payment and getting financing. Well, now that equity is returning, we're seeing the number one and number two really be lack of available homes, and I just can't find what I want. So um, part of that is really you know, making sure your product and your communities and all of that are geared towards what they're looking for, but a big portion of that, as many of you are struggling with, is supply is much lower today, and so um, that can be an advantage. As we look to um, what consumers are looking for, as far as size goes, um, that number is up. It's up from 40% to 42% are actually looking for a larger home today, but most builders will translate that to 3,000 square feet or more, and it isn't. The top home size consumers are looking for today across the country, and this doesn't change dramatically by region. Um, not a lot of these answers change a lot dramatically by region, interestingly enough. But the top square footage is 2,000 to 2,400 square feet, followed by 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. And, and really what they want more than size is function. And so function over size, location, quality of home, those are all more important than actually getting a bigger home. Despite that, that number it has increased somewhat. Average home size for the country last year uh, is up slightly to 2,200 square feet. So it also ties with what's happening in the resale market. And of all of these, what I'm seeing as being significantly different between new and resale is very little. The biggest advantage, and you'll see that in one of our top trends, is about being able to offer individuality and personalization in the new home market today. So when we looked at what consumers wanted, the only thing that was significantly different is that we found the consumer looking in the new home market has a far greater priority of getting a personalized home, being able to pick their options, being able to have choice, and all of those things, which is really logical. So what does style mean to them? As we looked at the inside of the home, we gave them 16 plus choices to choose from. And the top style that they wanted, um, and this changes a little bit by age, but not dramatically, but the average style that, that people wanted most was modern traditional, followed by traditional, and then contemporary. And as you look to the left, you'll see the image that they actually chose as their favorite. And once again, we gave them about 16 images to choose from with different styles on it. But you'll see 
the image to the, uh, to the left has very sort of clean lines. It has a contemporary edge to it, but there's definitely a traditional flair in there as well. One of our, as we're getting towards some of our last trends, which I think this one's a pretty interesting one, is today shoppers have more pets than children. So 66% of all of our shoppers actually have pets today. And of those shoppers, 20% 20 percent treat their pets like royalty. And another 9% of these pets live outdoors. And so when you, when I, I just recently saw this at Target, um, and some, I've, I'm seeing this all over, but now there's now a refrigerated section for dog food. Um, there are now gourmet pet cookie stores for dogs. I mean, it, it's crazy. So as I look at this, and I look at the numbers, and I look at 30% of U.S. shoppers out there have family households, if you're not including the 18-plus groups or young couples, you know, what does that mean for community design? What does that mean for home design? What does that mean in how you invest and where you invest? Certainly those are all pretty important. As it relates to age-restricted versus age-targeted versus multi-generational neighborhoods, today 18% of consumers actually want an age-restricted age -restricted community. This, this is down slightly from about 20 to 22% as I've seen over the last couple of decades, but not dramatically. And another interesting fact is another 18% want age-targeted, so 36% of the total shoppers out there um, said they are actually looking for a childless community. So that's something to think about as you guys are planning. 65% or 64, 65% actually want multi-generational. So there's some good hard firm numbers behind those and that's been a, a great discussion for the last several years. Last but not least, one of my favorite trends as we looked at a lot of the attitudinal information we have is <clears throat> We're seeing a much higher percentage of shoppers out there looking to disconnect when they get home versus connect 24-7. Now, these numbers would have been much different 10 years ago, but with the overstimulation of technology and cell phones and all those things, I hear more discussions in focus groups and some of the research we're doing where people rave about a vacation they had because the Wi-Fi was down or there was no connectivity where I was able to actually put my cell phone down for seven days. We are looking at that as a big trend going forward and something I think that consumers are going to crave. I'm not suggesting we remove Wi-Fi from all households or communities, but creating sort of those special places that allow consumers to connect indoors and outdoors. I believe that's why the outdoor rooms are becoming so important. Spotlight features are certainly big. Um, the man cave for men, um, certainly we're seeing those pop up quite a bit and lots of debates on that. Um, just great chill spaces in the community, that outdoor fireplace where I can just connect with a couple of my friends. So any way that you can create that in your community, in your homes, I think is really, really important as you think about design and how you invest. A couple of interesting things, ones. these are outside the trends, but I thought they were important for some of the builders. I saw quite a few builders on the list out there. and how you're reaching consumers. I thought this was uh, pretty interesting when we asked consumers what the, what the top sort of social media sites that they were using. Um, we spend a lot of money as, as home builders and developers on Facebook and Twitter and all those things, and those are certainly important. But number one is your website, the home builder website, according to uh, the new home world. If I look at just the Zillow sample, which is our reset sample, of course Zillow ranks number one, which is very positive. In just the new home sample, Zillow ranks number two, so it still ranks very high, followed by websites like Realtor.com and, and Trulia. So those are very, very big. <clears throat> the other thing that was interesting to me is that 71% will actually shop online first before ever seeing a model or open house. So I know everyone knows this, but having those websites working really well, um, it, it's huge. It's not an area that I would skimp. It's as important as the merchandising of your model. Another huge one is 62% will use their iPad um, while shopping for a home. Um, I look at communities all over the country, and, and unfortunately, sometimes the, the builder apps are tough to use. Um, and so having that right, I think, is critical. And 64% will actually use their iPhone while shopping. So it must be legible. When you punch in that address, you have got to be able to find that community. Um, and oftentimes, the addresses I have found on builder websites you can't even pull those up on, on GPS systems or on, on the mapping programs on your phone. So 
um, having that being really functional and easy is great. And Zillow, I think, has the, the best application out there. And, and the consumers confirmed it. It was the most common application while shopping for a home on a mobile device. And it was substantially greater. I think 64% chose that as their primary source uh, for shopping for a home. And then it dropped down to about 34% uh, for builder websites and so forth. So that wraps up some of our high-level trends and details. I did want to share, you know, we have a lot on shopper attitudes, how they live, how they shop, what they value, um, interior preferences, exterior preferences, texture, color. All of these things we're looking at how that translates to value and making a better investment. Home layout did rank um, and continues to rank as our top in our top three trends. So understanding kitchens and bathrooms and, and how to make great spaces and where does technology get paid for, like green technology or not. Um, architecture, where do you spend the money, where don't you spend the money, community amenities, parks, lifestyle, and of course green technology and home technology. Consumers want green technology, and, and if you look at the numbers, it's a very high percentage, um, but they want to get paid for that green technology. So again, the more you can define that, it will pay them back for that investment is, is super important. And home technology certainly is important. People do want to stay wired, um, and they do want, um, just like everything you buy, um, whether it's a cell phone or a new computer, you want the latest and greatest, and you're paying a premium for new, so they expect the best technology in their homes today. So that wraps up um, my uh, summary of sort of top trends. There's a whole lot more, um, but I would turn it over um, to the group. Thanks, Molly. Uh, you can go ahead. Can you change your control over to Laura? And I'll uh, just thank you so much for that insightful yeah. and useful information. That was terrific. And I know the builder portion of our audience really appreciated those bonus stats that you shared. So thanks for taking the time to do that. As we wrap up 2013, this is great food for thought as we prepare for the new year. Uh, just a reminder, if you guys have any questions for Molly, I'd encourage you to use the webinar chat feature asking your question. And we'll cover those at the end of the program today. We now turn our attention to today's sponsor, Isonine. Isonine open cell and closed cell spray foam insulation products are one-step performance, performance materials which both insulate and air seal a building for the lifetime of the structure. They are guaranteed to perform as specified for the life of the building. And presenting for Isonine today is Paul Duffy, Vice President of Engineering. I'd now like to pass the presentation over to Paul. Um, and thank you, Molly, as well. You provided a, a pretty good lead-in to some of the things I wanted to talk about. This is going to be less a commercial, more a, a bit of a, an insight as to how spray foam can help you in your businesses, um, because I think a lot of folks, as Molly indicated, are looking for green, they're looking for energy efficiency, and spray foam gives you that in spades, and it gives you one of the most recognizable features um, uh, in new homes today. So basically, what I wanted to speak about was spray foam, spray polyurethane foam, understanding the opportunity. And I, before I did that, give you a little bit of a, a history of who I am, who we are. Isonine, basically, is a company that uh, uh, is considered the leader in uh, spray foam. Uh, Isonine products have been around for more than 25 years. Some folks call spray foam generically uh, isonine. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like the Kleenex of the spray foam industry. But there are other manufacturers out there. And I, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the isonine difference. Um, basically, our, our corporate structure includes distribution uh, facilities in Memphis, Tennessee, Newark, New Jersey, and City of Industry, California. Uh, we have more than 25 years experience. The product portfolio, this might be news to some people, includes a variety of spray foams, both light density and medium density, both water blown and blowing agent spray foams. And I'll talk a little bit about what those attributes mean. But our company has grown worldwide to include more than 30 countries. Part of what we bring to the table is working relationships with some important strategic partners that should be of value to you folks. We're really trying to take the next step and make sure that all of our products are properly accredited so that you get the needed uh, points and ResNet rating scales, lead rating scales, uh, uh, all of these uh, third-party accreditations that are so important in terms of 
uh, making your house stand out from the crowd. So that's part and parcel of what we bring to the table. We do that with the product portfolio, and we make sure that we bring to you a network of trained uh, dealers that are similarly accredited. In a nutshell, what is spray foam? Spray foam is actually different from your, your grandmother's insulation, if you will, in that it's a product that both insulates and air seals. And if you know a little bit about energy efficiency, you'll understand how important that air seal really is. Basically, insulation without an air seal ends up being a filter. Air passes through it, and it provides no energy efficiency. So the air seal is critical to making sure that you get the value for money out of the products that you are installing in your home. And spray foam is a product that a lot of builders have stumbled upon because we saw problematic details like bonus rooms, rooms over garages, those rim header assemblies and cantilevered floors, bay windows and such that have previously been difficult to insulate and difficult to get right. Um, in that the product controls air leakage and interstitial con convection, and it bonds to adjacent spring, uh, framing, it forms an integral part of the air barrier system. An air barrier system is increasingly being cited in codes. A lot of my talk is, is talking specifically about the products that we sell, which are technically called high-pressure foam products. They're products that are installed via truck-based rigs. The folks come in, they're professional contractors, they come in with an insulation setup, they get in, do their work, and get out. Uh, products arrive in two 55-gallon drums, and the equipment that's on the rig basically mixes and proportions that, uh, those raw materials such that they perform, uh, uh, as they become the perfect mix of spray foam. So moving on to look at the products, what's the difference? Basically, low-density and medium-density foams primarily are different in density and physical properties. The half pound density is the light spray foam. It's the flexible stuff, the stuff that Isonine was originally known for. Basically, it has about R3.7 per inch. So it's much like any other insulation product that you're used to, except it also provides the all-critical air seal. It's sprayed in one pass, easy to trim, so you can spray it in, scarf it off, and fully fill cavities and interstitial spaces with minimal effort. Some of you environmentally conscious folks in the audience will know about things like ozone depletion potential, ODP. ODP for light density spray foam, our light density spray foam, is zero, which is great. We've solved the problems that were previously associated with spray foam. We don't deplete the ozone layer. And it has a low global warming potential, basically a global warming potential of one. That highlights one of the differences that you see between the low density and the medium density foams. The medium density foams, and we do sell those as well, have a higher R value per inch, but they do that with a captive blowing agent. And the captive blowing agent has a low ozone depletion potential, but it has a high global warming potential. So it's one of the reasons why you might want to choose low density over medium density if you can reasonably uh, install and spec it in the space available. But these are the kinds of things that you'd speak to your Isonine dealer about. He can provide you more information, and certainly there's lots of support that we offer at Isonine headquarters with our engineering and building science staff. Um, lots of things that we do basically trans, uh, uh, transport into benefits for you. All of our products, you might be surprised to know, can be used in types 1 to 5 construction. So you get into multifamily ha uh, housing, larger buildings. We can do that too with spray foam. It's all code approved through AC377 by the ICC Evaluation Service. Um, our products are specifically formulated to A, resist moisture, and the low density permits drying, whereas the uh, medium density um, forms a barrier to water. So we're very conscious that insulation, moisture problems. These are things that properly specified spray foam can be a big help in solving uh, moisture problems in new houses. My point to you, I guess, is that not all spray foam is spray foam. The thing that makes spray foams different is what we call the B side of the mix. The B side is a proprietary mix of polyols, catalysts, surfactants, and other um, important ingredients like flame retarders that actually give the foam its inherent 
characteristics. And isonine characteristics basically are foams that reject water and help to uh, give you the desired moisture performance that you seek in your new construction. Not all formulations are the same. They are different. So spray foam is not spray foam. Only isonine is isonine. In terms of the dealer install installer component of things, we bring a trained dealer community. Um, this is highly specialized equipment, probably upwards of $100,000 worth of equipment on the rig um, to give you the best possible products. If you think about it, these folks are actually manufacturing the insulation in the field, so it's important that they be properly trained. And we touch everything from how you install the product through health and safety, building science, codes, the whole nine yards that are needed to do the job right. In terms of a message to uh, a diverse group like the one on the, uh, on the call here, I recognize that you're all in different uh, locales, building perhaps in several states, each with different codes. On, you know, this gives you the patchwork quilt that is the code landscape out there. Basically, some states don't even have a code. Some are on the 2012 code. Other states are every flavor in between. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. Your isonine dealer knows exactly what the code requirements are in terms of R value and air sealing. In terms of just where the codes have gone over the past few years, the 06 code is used as the reference point by most, uh, most folks out there. It's considered 100 on the HERS scale. You probably heard about that through organizations like ResNet. So if ICC 2006, the International Energy Code 2006, is 100, then ICC 2009 is actually 85, or 15% more efficient. And you can see in the table that I've got up here how that starts to uh, build out to different R values. Step one step further to the 2012 code, you can see you're moving to higher levels of energy efficiency, basically a HERS target of 70, and much higher levels of insulation. So getting it right, making sure that you get maximum performance out of that insulation, all this stuff is important. What's important about the uh, latest versions of the code is that they give you higher levels of air tightness as well. If the air tightness of the 2012 code is uh, in the range of three to five air changes per hour, and that's very, very tight. It's probably um, a third of the air leakage that we had just uh, three or four years ago. So moving into um, uh, the products that we have, basically you can see that we have light density and medium density products that are suitable for these applications. And you'd, you'd specify a medium density, say, if you had some restrictions in the space, or maybe you're looking for a barrier to water. Maybe you're, you're building in a FEMA flood zone, something like that. Those folks in Louisiana could probably relate to that. Um, at the end of the day, each product has its own specific attributes, and your isonine dealer is the expert in trying to select the right foam for the right application. And while we're on applications, basically, let's step through a few of them. Basement walls. Basically, all of these applications have specific requirements that are set out in code. So it's important that you're dealing with people who have the backup of building science training and, uh, and uh, the best installers to install their products. The basement wall application is exposed to the interior space. You'd need a thermal barrier or a half-inch drywall over that foam. In a crawl space, you wouldn't need it to be covered. So you'd be able to save some costs there. Understanding the code requirements is part and parcel of doing the job right and keeping your costs under control. Looking at sills and headers, there in that location, if you use less than three and a, half, a quarter inches, you can basically uh, spray the foam without any coating whatsoever being required. In exterior walls, basically, you'd require a thermal barrier. Again, half-inch drywall is the typical one, so it's no significant change to your construction process. But you know, understanding where this fits into code and everything is code compliant can be part and parcel of making the switch to a new technology like spray foam. Um, what a lot of folks use spray foam for is the complex parts of the building. Um, difficult curves, 
projecting floors, these sorts of things. And that's because spray foam air seals and insulates. It stops the cold air in the wintertime or the excessively hot and humid air in the summertime from getting into those spaces and causing structural problems. So spray foam is, is part of the solution to some of the building science type callbacks that you've been receiving. It's an important tool in the arsenal of, of trying to do the job right. When while we're on the job, the, the, the subject of doing the job right, a lot of folks come to spray foam because they're looking to do things like unvented attics. If you put all of your mechanical systems up in the attic, that attic can be quite inhospitable, inhospitable to heating and cooling equipment. So you'd like to have an insulation product there on the underside of the roof deck that brings all of that equipment and ductwork indoors. It makes it perform that much better and that much more efficiently. And in fact, the only type of insulation product that you can use in that application is a product that's an air impermeable insulation. So spray foam has that in spades. And you can see why a lot of folks spray foam the underside of their roof deck as part of their new housing spec. We have a product specifically designed for that application, a product that doesn't require an ignition barrier. It's Isonine Classic Max. If you're making the call on, on going to an unvented attic, we urge you to consider Isonine Classic Max and ask our dealer for pricing on that particular item because you'll find it has um, excellent properties in terms of uh, performance as well as cost. So whoa. in terms of the, um, uh, the summary to my presentation, I guess basically the message is really simple. Um, back up one more. There are lots of applications for different types of spray foam. Uh, your isonine dealer and uh, that backed up by the building science support and head office basically can provide you with guidance on what's the right product for the right application. We've got application specific recommendations for all climate zones, all, all types of applications in buildings. There's a spray foam solution that can do the job right, do it better than you're currently doing today, um, and put you at the leading edge of energy efficiency and green technology. So partner with us. We're, we're uh, looking forward to working with everybody. Um, give us a call, and we'd be happy to help. Thanks, Paul. That's terrific. I know I visited your booth last year at the International Builder Show in Las Vegas. Are you guys going to be there again in 2014? Actually, uh, this year at 2014, um, we're uh, doing a couple of other shows. The, um, the next time we're at IBS will be 2015. So okay. um, we are available. Uh, uh, we have uh, staff that are at the uh, NAHB uh, meetings in uh, Las Vegas. Um, but um, and, and we can't and we can't arrange meetings with anybody who's interested. But I'd ask them to get a hold of uh, either head office here or get a hold of their local licensing rep to find out where and when we could get together with you. The, uh, con the, the, uh, the contact for home sphere builders is a gentleman by the name of Tim Comstock. Um, so if you ask for him, you can be rooted to the right guy who has the answers that you need. That's great. I met Tim last year in Vegas for the first time, and he's a terrific gentleman. So I appreciate you uh, stating his contact information. And you guys will have my contact information. This is Heather Knutson, Director of Marketing for Homesphere, at the close of this. So if you want to reach out to me with any questions or any uh, connections that you'd like to make, please do so. Molly, um, we had a couple questions come through. Most of them are, are questions where they want a copy of your presentation because it was so much information to digest. Um, so you and I can handle those afterwards, and there will be a recording on the Homesphere website posted by Close of Business Friday. If you check back, if you like us on Facebook, uh, you can stay tuned for future webinars and events, and you'll be the first alerted once that's available. Molly, I believe you and your team are going to be out at IBS in February. Is that accurate? That's correct. Do you, um, I don't think you guys have a booth, but based on the trends that you spoke about, we have a couple extra minutes. What do you suspect will look different in 2014 compared to what we saw out there in 2013? You know, it's, it's, there, that's a big answer. And so I think it depends on if you're asking about community design or home design or really just consumer attitudes as a whole. I think we're going to start um, to see more focus on function over size. 
Um, it'll be interesting. And that's both outside spaces and indoor spaces. I think as prices start to um, continue to rise and interest rates potentially rise with that, I think being able to perform in smaller spaces will be important. We've had a great year with move up products out there in the market. And, uh, and certainly there's been a lot of pent-up demand over the last seven years, but I think a, a new focus towards better space and more functional space should be a, a huge focus to be successful in the future. That's great. And I know we look forward to connecting with your team out there as well. A couple more questions came in, and they're mostly around getting a copy of your presentation. So you and I can sync up. Anyone's sure. welcome to uh, email me, and I respond to each of those individually. Again, visit us on Facebook um, and like us there so that you're the first to know about these events. I want to thank Molly Carmichael at John Burns Real Estate Consulting, as well as Paul at Isonine for their valuable information today. And I wish everybody a good day and look forward to connecting with you on our webinar in 2014 Q1. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us.